So I would say, again, it's, it's down to preparation. It's, it's thinking of contingencies. It's thinking of if this happens, I can do this, or if that happens, I can do that. It's all about having a, a, a forethought for any situation that can happen, especially with kit, especially when it's from a safety perspective um, and being flexible and being flexible. And when these things happen, when these things break down and these situations break down, you don't panic, you don't flap, you just stop whatever it is you're doing and try to think level head, level headedly about what you can do and what impact this is having on, on the trip. What I would do if I was worried about upcoming weather condition, I'd monitor the conditions all the time, day and night. Um, and then from a safety perspective, if there was any risk, um, I probably would pull back. Uh, it depends on what, though, what in relation to those safety conditions are, or those weather conditions, whether it's mountains or anything like that. So I'd always err on the, on the side of safety. Fear and anxiety. Depends whether you're actually on the expedition and it's in relation to a life-threatening situation or not. Um, if you have fear and anxiety in your tent at night, I would think um, I would try and find some ways to relax, some meditation techniques, listen to music. If you're doing some physical activity like you're climbing or canoeing or uh, sailing or something along those lines, fear and anxiety might be related to dangers that are involved in that sort of present environment. So it would be all about trying to mitigate the risks of what you're doing, making sure you know your navigation, safety procedures and all that kind of thing. So it's probably two sides to it. But I think with good preparation, you can reduce the risk of fear and anxiety because you know what needs to be done in case something happens. I think when you have someone that's crossing crossing the line, I think you, you, you've got to approach it in a, just a calm way, uh, again, one-to-one, -one, um, and just have a conversation with them and ask them why they're making those decisions. Um, and also speak to them about the impact of their decisions, if because their impact, they might be a stronger climber, they might be a stronger paddler, and the decisions that they're making might impact the group who aren't as strong a climber, who aren't a stronger paddler. We always have to work to the to the ability of the of the weakest person. Now, if that fragments and people are going off doing their own things and climbing a different route when you're supposed to be going up this route because it's the safest, it might be the longest, and that one might be the shortest. Okay, that's not a good thing. You can't maintain that sort of that security within the group and that safety of the group. So, I would address that person and 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 more so have a conversation first. But then, if it happens again then you've got to address it with probably a little bit more assertiveness and say, is there anything that broke down this time? Is there anything we can do together? Is there anything I can do better? And then if it happens a third time, you might have to address it with a little bit more um, assertiveness and a little bit more, um, okay, okay, I'm the leader of this. If you can do this my way now, I'd appreciate that. Um, and this is how it's going to happen and, and, and tell them why. The why is the most important thing. If you tell someone to do something, they need to know why because there's usually you know, a fundamental reason for it, which is generally safety. I think be, being flexible and letting go of control is important. That, that control can, can um, lead you, maybe that bit and that stubbornness will get you so far, it might get you up a mountain and stuff like that, but that stubbornness or that, can, that, that, that control might hinder your decision-making ability, I believe. So you've got to stay flexible to the environment, the conditions, the terrain, the situation, the people, the personalities, my position within all that. I think it's just being flexible and open um, and responsive to whatever's happening around you and then trying to deal with whatever changes with a clear, clear head as possible. Sometimes it might mean you've got to act quick, um, but majority of the time, you can and you do have time to stop and think about what the best thing to do is, and then you can act on that. Um, again, preparation. Um, if, you've, if you've come to a situation where you've consumed more water than you thought you were going to, um, I would say that at that point, start looking on the map for water sources if you can and then that starts from then moving into the process of is this water safe to drink is it flowing is it stagnant um you have to then look upstream if to see if there's any um, dead animals or anything like that that can contaminate the water but i i would say uh ration the water if it just get to a point um and then set a set a procedure or a plan in place to find a water source and um don't push on too far ahead uh, with that, if, if, if the water is a limit, make the water source a priority. I thought people would 
be okay or I saw that they had done X, Y, Z and I assumed that they would be okay. Um, so I think choo choosing a team uh, is the fun is one of the most fundamental parts to any expedition that you do with people that you don't know. So I think um, choosing a team and choosing teammates is 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 something to spend time doing um, and don't rush it. Uh, making sure you get recommendations um, and get to know the person before you come on the trip, if at all possible. Difficult for me when I did a trip when I had a photographer from Brooklyn and, and two people from Montreal. So I only had con Skype conversations with these people. So. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say get to, get to know your team, make sure you're clear with the goals, their values, what's important to them, what's not important to them, their skill sets, what do they feel they can bring to the expedition, um, what do they want out of the trip, that's so important. Um, can they do any post-expedition writing, photography, uh, talking about it um, to sort of help share the story. Um, but I think that the human relationships on expeditions are the most important aspect because when they break down, the expedition breaks down. So if you focus on that at the beginning um, and you get that right, I think you, you're on to a winner. It, yeah, it can, if, especially if you're going away for quite a few days or months um, and you haven't got comms with family or loved ones, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever. Um, yeah, it can be, it can, it can be a real, a real hardship and those first few weeks that kind of separation anxiety of being away from family is quite hard to deal with but um, at the same time you learn to value your family and value the access that you have to your family so each week or, or, or whatever or day that goes by when you then get to speak to them it makes that all more enjoyable and it's something that we kind of take for granted in the modern world which is that kind of abundance of access that we have to our family members and people and we you usually take it for granted but when you're on a trip um, depending on the, the the nature of the trip or the danger aspect involved with the trip it can put everything into perspective so uh, I always usually really enjoy it when when I'm away and I get the chance to chance to speak to them. If if you was going into a place where language is a huge issue, uh, I would uh, probably do some prior um, practice into language or the, a specific language of that region. Sometimes it's dialect, so it's so difficult if you're traveling long distance, there's a mass change in dialect, but language um, differences. I would, and I have done, written stuff down on, in a notepad, sort of basic sentences, basic languages, um, and, sorry, basic sentences. And, and and passages and also I've uh, in the, once in Indonesia I wrote down um, a, a a sentence I translated a sentence and a passage like a paragraph of why I was doing the expedition and why I was so happy to be there. So when you said that to people, you're kind of crossing that sort of cultural boundary. You might not be able to say anything other than that, other than a smile and a handshake, but they kind of know why you're there and they know you're coming from a good place. Um, and a lot of the time when you go into places where there is a mass language boundary, normally a smile and a handshake is important. Um, if you have a translator with you, that's brilliant. Uh, but 99, you know, nine times out of 10, you're not gonna have a translator with you at all. So I think, respectfully if you go to a country where there is language issues learning some local language before you go hello goodbye how are you um is is a is a, is a respectful thing to do i think it's keeping things simple small uh small happy items for me it would be a book or chocolate uh mostly chocolate um but I think it's trying to make your, com your, your immediate world as comfortable as possible, um, a place where you can relax because expeditions and being outdoors and adventures can sometimes be mentally and physically taxing. And when you're in that place where you can rest, I think it's just about being as comfortable and relaxed as, as possible. When people can't talk and then they're talking behind your back or stuff like that or anything along those lines, that's, that's really corrosive. So there has to be a framework for people to be able to communicate. Communicate Communication on expeditions, well, basically life is, is the thread of everything that happens, communication. You have bad communication, things fall apart. So I think if you're on an expedition, you're part of or lead in an expedition, everybody has to communicate. And if, if you're in that framework of communication, someone can come to me and say, Ian, I've got... I've got some, a problem with this or I've got a problem with that or I've got a problem with you. I've got a problem with your decision making. And I can do the same with them. Um, it's when those boundaries aren't set um, and roles aren't set where people 
step into new roles and they start doing things they shouldn't be, not necessarily shouldn't be doing, but they feel they should be doing them. Um, and then that's when all the wires get crossed and uh, problems happen. Yeah, I think probably the, the turning point with regards to human failure is not putting too much pressure on yourself. Um, trying to trying to do things to impress people or trying to do things for external means. Everything should be an, you know, an internal enjoyment or passion. Um, and failure is, is, is just feedback. That's all failure is. Failure is feedback to saying something's not really working here or some, something you've done hasn't been planned properly. But failure isn't something that you should take to heart. Failure is, is, is just part of the process. Um, so on some of my, my trips, because I lead trips for people at the moment, uh, one, I, one of the things I say to people is a secret weapon is earplugs. Because foam earplugs are a godsend. If it's really windy or it's, or it's raining, the sound on a tent can be deafening. Um, so putting in earplugs, uh, is a, or foam earplugs, is a, is, is a great way to go forward. But at the same time, you're in nature. So why would you want to be blocking out the sound of nature, which could be owls, it could be animals and wildlife and things like that. So there's a, there's a, a flux between the two. But earplugs, foam earplugs, secret weapon. Uh, knowledge, knowledge of the, the region that you're going to, knowledge of what you can and can't forage, what plants are okay uh, to, to touch or to consume. Um, again, it comes down to if you're going on an adventure or an expedition, understanding the region that you're going to, the flora and fauna, the geology, where things grow, where they don't grow, where they grow at high terrain or low terrain. Um, but just having a good understanding of where you're going to first, really look into that region and look at the flora and fauna. And if there's any a point where you realise or you understand that there's, you're not sure about something you can and can't take or something you can and can't touch, just it's best not to do it at all. I, I mean, I don't mind being mucky, dirty, cold, wet, hungry, tired. Uh, it's part of what makes adventure adventure. Um, it's just one of those things that um, you just have to just take on the chin. It's part and parcel of it. Uh, there will be a point when you'll be warm and you'll have a full stomach and you'll be dry and you'll be in a bed with your head on a pillow at some point. But what makes adventure is sometimes the challenge, the physical, the mental challenge and being dirty and cold and tired and hungry is, is part of that. I think feedback's important, something like that, um, for them to feel success. They, they need to feel like they're, they're doing something and they're achieving something and they have a purpose to what they do. Um, if we don't say anything or if I don't say anything that we're doing well or this is what we need to do, you've done that really well today, X, Y, Z. I think people need to be rewarded in some, some capacity, not, not physical means, but they, they just need to know that they're doing well. And when they know they're doing well, they'll continue to sort of work hard and they'll continue to work for you. Um, or the greater vision of the whole trip, maybe not me, just the, the greater vision of the trip. Um, but it's just vocalising things like this. It, it, it's for them to feel success and feel like they're doing well, you, you have to kind of vocalise that and make a point of vocalising it as well. If your feet, if your feet are damp, uh, you can use uh, talcum powder and stuff like that. But I would say one of the best things to do if your feet are damp is to air them as much as you can. Um, and that stops all the wrinkling and then the sort of the onset of trench foot, which is you know, where the skin breaks down at the latter stages of when the feet are so damp. Um, but air in the feet as much as possible. Um, and if you can, when you're in the sleeping bag, air the feet, try not to have the socks, have your damp socks on your feet at all times. Just hung, hang them up and try and dry them. Or I've put them inside my pants sometimes to dry them, or I've tied socks around my thighs and around my, everything like that in the sleeping bag to, to dry them. You won't dry them efficiently, but you'll dry them a little bit different because ultimately if, if you're walking, if you're hiking a long distance and you don't take care of your feet, uh, that's not a good thing. So you've got to look after your feet and look after your mind. Uh, just set yourself a plan uh, to call back home as and when you can, or, to, or make sure before you go away, <clears throat> if it's your mum, your spouse, your girlfriend, etc., making sure they know that there's going to be some time between calls. Um, it's going to be a couple of weeks between phone calls, um, and if there's any if there's any problems, that you're going to be contacted. But just try just being clear and open with with what exactly is going to happen, what happens is going to go down. Because especially with someone like my mum, she you know she struggled with me being away for three months and speaking every two or three weeks. But if I t if I tell her that I'm going to be speaking every two or three weeks, she knows. It's when they don't know, that's the problem, and they haven't heard from you, and they know there's bears wherever it is you're going. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, the whole mixed mixed gender is is, is important, um, and there's so many things that women bring to expeditions that don't guys don't, and vice versa. So, uh, I, I would say that in when, when there's an expedition that I've been on with my girlfriend once, so um, even though we're boyfriend and girlfriend, we still had separate tents. Because I think you have to have that kind of what I call your own personal kingdom where there's a place that you can go and you can relax. And I think it's important for women to have that place and men and everything like that. Um, and also having that respect for different ways of doing things, different values, different ways of seeing things, approaching things and executing things um, that, that cross those boundaries between the sexes. And, ju and just looking at the strengths that both, both sides can bring and making sure those strengths are employed in the right places. Um... Well, having a variety of, of, of usually dehydrated rations, which is on expeditions, um, having a good variety of six or seven meals is a good start. Um, sometimes we've now with the, 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 the vegetarian world, there's not so many, so many options. But uh, I've taken stuff from uh, smashed mashed potato, dried mashed potato, bacon bits, uh, palm, little tubs of Parmesan cheese, tiny little tubs of uh, oregano and um, uh, rosemary and thyme and sage, uh, little uh, flavoured peppers, um, Tabasco sauce is another good one that you can put into stuff to spice it up. Um, anything to change what your, you know, what, what your your main meal. But in the morning, I usually would take a big bag of nuts with dried fruits, chocolates, uh, Brazil nuts, everything in it in a huge big bag. And if I had a breakfast that was comprised of porridge and um, muesli or something like that, take a big handful of the nuts, put them in, um, and then rehydrate that or put water in that. Um, and I think when it comes to, to meals, it's all about sort of, it's grazing rather than big, heavy meals, just grazing throughout the journey so your, en your energy stays topped up and, um, yeah, and, you, and you stay motivated. Uh, altitude, that's, yeah, I've had personal experience of, of being in quite a bad way of being when I've been at altitude. Um, and the, the best thing to do would be, if, there's any, if you have any uh, medical problems at altitude, is just to drop altitude. It's as simple as that. And then before you'd gone on that trip, you would have known the signs and symptoms, or it would be good to know the signs and symptoms of altitude sickness, the, the vast array of symptoms. So it, if you're getting any of those symptoms or you're concerned, it's just to drop altitude and hydrate as much as possible. Uh, I think giving that ownership and sense of control to someone is empowering them. Um, and at the beginning of a trip, you want to make sure that they know what the goal is uh, of the expedition, um, what, they, what, what I would like to get out of it, what the main sort of the vision for it is, and then what they would like to get out of it. I think they, um, it's very important that they, if they're investing so much time, money, commitment, love, all sorts of stuff into such a huge trip. They're, they're going to want to get something out of it. Um, and a lot of the time it's adventure and things like that. But sometimes, like some of the, 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 the experiences that I've had, you know, there's, the, there's other needs that they want met. And when they don't, things fall apart. So I think it's just getting clear on those needs and doing your best to meet them. Yeah, I think you have to do it with some humili humility. Um, I think you, you have to firstly take responsible for you be actually being the one to make the, that tough decision. Um, and then make, make sure you transpose that decision down to the group. Um, everyone knows that this is a tough decision to make. This is why I'm making this decision. This is how it, um, this is how it could effectively potentially um, affect the group. Um, and also asking feedback on that decision. Asking is there anywhere I can improve that decision that I'm making? Is there any best, better methodologies to making this decision? Am I making the right decision? You never know, it might not be. You might be making out of, a, out of an emotional response to something. Um, so I think it's, it's you making the decision, but including everyone in that decision. Um, manage, managing personalities and teammates over a long time um, requires patience, it requires um, flexibility, requires communication, personal space, uh, allowing personal space, receiving personal space, um, listening a lot of the time, um, and just making sure that both of you or, the, or those people stay motivated um, and they're getting what they want out of the expedition or the journey. 
I think it's important that you can, um, if you're just a bit part in a, in a larger sort of structure and a bit larger machine, they can, people within the team can probably lose lose sight a little bit and lose a little bit of um, motivation. It's keeping people just empowered and keeping people included, having a role, having an importance and a purpose in everything. Um, the minute they do that, their mind will go, motivation will go and you'll lose them and then you'll be pulling them back. So I think it's just, that, again, down to communication, staying, staying, keeping that thread between every team member, but not having that thread too tight, letting that thread go sometimes. Um, but when, um, when you need to, just pulling them in a bit and, and, commu and communication is vital. I think I would try to stop and think realistically about why you're there. Are you there to achieve this 100, 200, 1,000 mile walk or hike or canoe or whatever? Um, think about the goal. Are you really attached to the goal? Um, can you sort of still get the same um, enjoyment and, and, and pleasure out of the expedition by not completing that goal? And if you wasn't going to complete it, I think coming to terms with the fact that you're not going to complete it is important. Months, years of planning and then you're failing. And I'm not used to failing because I, when I try to do things, I try to do them properly and try to achieve them. I and mean, failure is sometimes the hardest thing to, the, to deal with. But once you've got a grasp of that, and once you accept that not everything always works out, um, you then, you kind of project yourself into the present moment and then you just appreciate being exactly where you are in that moment. And you feel lucky to be what you're doing, what you're doing. Um, and then you can kind of detach from the goal itself and then just be like, whatever happens, happens. Let's just roll with that by constantly asking myself, is this the right thing to do? Is this the safe thing to do? Um, am I okay? I do, is my skill set right to tackle whatever that is I'm about to tackle? Do I need further training? So I, I, I canoed the, the Yukon River once and that was the first time I'd ever done a long distance canoe. Uh, and I trained specifically for canoeing prior to, prior to that expedition. So I did, I did everything that would facilitate shoulders, chest, back to facilitate the motion of, of canoeing. So I would say um, if you're, you're planning to do a certain type of trip, just, make, just think about the trip that you're doing and prepare in good time for that trip and understand potentially the injuries that could come from a trip that you're doing and then have something in your mind about if that kind of injury happens, what am I gonna do? Whether it's torn muscles, torn ligaments, broken legs, um, or anything like that in relation to your, your sort of specific niche of that trip. Just have an understanding of what you need to do to prepare and also if something goes wrong, what you can do to sort of counteract that. I would probably say if you're in that, that kind of a situation, you'd, you'd be channeled into navigation. So if you're in a whiteout or if you're in a, um, a place with where you can't see the horizon, you're you're doing something maybe over a longer distance. So navigation at that moment in time would probably be uh, paramount. Um, and what I'd probably do is is break break whatever it is I'm doing down into small sort of achievable steps. Just say right, okay, making sure we get here within the next half an hour. Okay, when we get there, we're going to have a break, uh, and then the next half an hour, we're going to do this. We're going to have a break, um, and just start thinking about, especially if you're a leader. So thinking about what you can do once you get to that point. We're going to have a break. Can we check kit? Can we do this? Can we play a little game for a couple of minutes just to bring everybody back round? Yeah, I would just say, but at the same time, just keep the mind focused in the back of the mind. Keep the mind focused that you're there to do what you need to do, and you're there to protect the, the team or make sure the team gets to where they're going. So you've got to stay switched on to a certain degree. Yeah, I'd say, again, just breaking down whatever you're doing into sort of small, small steps. Small steps are much easier to achieve, and when you achieve, you feel better. Um, if you think of the longer goal, if you look at the summit of the mountain and it looks really high, you're like, God, that's really high. If you think of that 100 metres there, you can quite happily walk to that 100 metres. So breaking everything down, just, just everything down into small steps. Uh, making everything clear, concise, making... Um, not making it these the commands aggressive, making sure that they're they are making sure your 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 instructions are understood. The page person knows again, going back to defined roles, everyone knows what they, they need to be doing, should be doing. Um and again if anyone's got any questions. I think those kind of situations just um they require assertiveness. Just a nice sharp assertiveness. Um and then uh yeah just making sure everyone knows what they're doing and um and if they're okay with it. Do they have any feedback? If you're the expedition leader, um, there has to be 
ultimate clarity within the team about the risk, uh, what needs to happen, um, the safety procedures if something does happen, um, actions on casualty, all of that kind of stuff. There is a set of procedures that you can go through, but not necessarily in a military sort of fashion like that, which is just one, two, three. It can just be getting everyone around prior to sort of reaching that that point of no return to got with regards to the risk and just getting everyone around and defining roles as well, making sure everyone knows what they need to be doing if something happens. Uh, the the the, the, uh, the strategy of everybody being in a certain position at a certain time um, and just making sure everyone's just switched on, make sure everyone knows that this situation has an element of risk and everyone needs to stay on their game um, until that risk has gone. If weather's making a situation risky, I probably would, um, at the first opportunity, stop, stop what it is, whatever I was doing, assess the situation. Um, and if I was with the group, I would probably have a, a consensus within the group about what the best thing to do at that point was um, and making sure that goes into like leadership and teamwork. Um, and then me probably being the leader, I would be the one making the decision. And if it was too dangerous to keep moving, which I've had a lot of time on my expeditions, I would, uh, I would stop and monitor the weather. And when the weather was good enough, continue on respect that they have different ways of doing things. The way I fold something or the way I open a food packet might be different to the way someone else does that. Um, I, th I think sp on expeditions where a lot of things happen within close proximity, uh, uh, you know, you've got to respect people, respect the way they, they, they do things, um, give them their breathing space um, and try and understand them. Try and understand that person that you're, you're sharing that space with, talk to them um, and also, uh, if they have, if they have ways of doing things that are slightly annoying, just accept that that's the way things are, and it's not going to last forever. In a, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you know, you won't you won't be in that position. One of the things when you're on a trip, adapting to your environment is is, I think sometimes probably, being as quiet as you can, and to sometimes just sitting and listening. Uh, I think on, on trips, because at the start of trips, you're always, everyone's excited and there's lots of stuff happening. There's lots of hustle and bustle. But I think um, taking yourself away and spending some time and thinking and looking at the environment and kind of taking it all in is, is, a, is a really great thing to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, when, I was, when I was in Alaska once, I missed Father's Day, Mother's Day, birthdays and stuff like that. And that's really, that's really quite hard. But what I did was I, I, I made a point of calling home on the sat phone or finding a way to contact my family um, on those days. Um, and if you're on an expedition, you can plan certain points along the trip where you're gonna stop and things like that. And you can even factor those points into the trip, into the planning at checkpoints. If you're, if you, if you're climbing or hiking long distance or paddling a long distance, you can stop at certain points, maybe on Father's Day or a birthday or something. And you can factor that in. So. Uh, what is the, is the difficult part is, is the minute the phone goes down and you're, you're not hearing your mum or dad's voice or your brother's or your wife's voice anymore. Um, but I always kind of, I always put myself in their shoes and think they're proud of what I'm doing. Um, and they wouldn't be so proud if I just come straight home now because I was homesick. Actually, when I was in the Marines, I, put, I had this picture in my mind when everything, whenever it was getting tough, I uh, just would picture in my mind my dad saying, don't you quit, don't you dare quit. Don't you even come home if you quit. I pictured that in my mind and I would get so riled up and almost to tears because of that. So it's things like that, you know, it's, it's people are proud of what you are doing and people are wishing they could be doing what you are doing. They're living vicariously through your social media or your images. So if, if you feel sad or you feel homesick or the, the family life is having a big impact, remember that you're out there doing a good thing and they're proud of you. I think um, when, when you go to places where the culture uh, and the environment is very different, it just approach that those situations with an open mind and just be conscious that uh, the places are very different to us, their culture, their heritage, heritage and traditions are very different to ours um, and respect that whenever you're there. When I was in the Marines, we used to have a thing called a yomp song and it would be a song that you would replay and sing probably 2000 times in your head over the space of a day. So yeah, songs can songs can do that. For me, when when I'm either canoeing or hiking or climbing or something like that, that's the time when ideas come to me. 
um, because obviously the external stimulation is not there from bright lights, phones, uh, all that kind of stuff. So when that's clear, I usually get a lot of ideas. So if, if obviously if not if I'm climbing, but if I'm paddling or hiking, I tend to just put notes into my phone and ideas and things like that. And it's amazing what comes to you in those monotonous moments when you're out doing sort of long distance stuff. Uh, and having just like a, a, a really good routine, a really good routine when it comes to, comes to sleep, because sleep is imperative to your physical sort of body and your energy and your mind. And you need all of those to be at optimum level when you're on an expedition, just purely for like decision making processes and for the physicality of the trip. Um, on expeditions, you, you, there are a, usually a lot of times when you don't get optimum sleep. So whenever you're having breaks or you're stopping, um, if there is enough time to have a, just a little bit of a cat nap, just put your head, put your hood up and just, just sleep for 10 to 15 minutes just to get that little bit of a recharge. Um, but a lot of the time, there isn't that time because you're, you're moving, you're doing things, you're working with people, you're climbing, you're doing whatever you need to do. So I would just say, if you can, focus on getting a good sleep when you can get sleep. In the past, I've taken it personally because I have high standards of myself, um, but I soon, I soon let go of that when on expeditions because um, so much changes and um, you can have high standards, but you've got to be flexible with those, those standards and not to be too hard on yourself um, because you do, you are going to make mistakes just as long as you kind of look at those mistakes and work out what went wrong and then try and build on that. I, in the past, I was yeah probably quite hard on myself for making mistakes, but um, that's because I just I, I I want to do I want to be good at what I want to do. But I would say just try and do away with that and just be aware that you're gonna you're gonna make a lot of mistakes um, and be okay with that. It's not a problem. Always look on the bright side. Always understand that there always is a positive and a negative there's always drawbacks and benefits pain and pleasure so if you're feeling something negative immediately ask yourself what am i gaining out of this situation because i truly believe on trips and expeditions when you're tired you can sink into negative energy but at the same time if you can sink into negative energy you can balance that with positive energy it's just a, it's just a thought process and a perception process and that's all it is um but i, I would just say think of all the uh, positive things that you've done that day, uh, positive things that you're doing on the trip, the, the, the goal of the trip, the, the positive health aspects or mental aspects that you're bringing to you and your team. It's almost endless what you can, what you can do. But sometimes you can almost be too high and then you forget the two, the two lows. So it's, it's, it's a constant balancing process. And I think that it's all about making sure that that balance stays in the center rather than the polarities. Yeah, in the Himalayas, I had a, had a massive issue with uh, at high altitude. I had mass dehydration and exhaustion, uh, borderline anemia, um, and uh, I messed up the vestibular system in my ears and my eyes. So I've got issues with balance now. And that, that was a huge um, knockback for me physically and mentally because of the military background. I thought I was invincible. Um, and for a couple of days, because I was ill and I had a gastrovirus, um, I didn't monitor that and taken enough fluids. And I kept climbing, kept climbing, kept climbing, kept, kept dehydrating um, to the point where I nearly collapsed, where the, the sort of military mentality kept me going, but I wasn't listening to my body. Um, and when I realized that I was in trouble, I thought at that point, I kind of went into this self-preservation process of thinking, I've done it now, what have I done? What have I done? And I thought at that moment, that, that moment I said to one of my friends, and I've only ever said this once is, um, you know, I'm in a bad way right now. I'm in a bad way. Because usually before I can get myself out of a situation, but that situation was an, a physical, serious physical problem. Um, and it took a lot to admit that, a lot to admit it. Um, and that, 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 that day changed my life. What I had wasn't gonna kill me. I'm, I'm not gonna die. Uh, I just got to sort of accept and um, and honour what was going wrong in my body and then say, look, I can still do what I want to do with my life. There is going to be some ways that I need to work around a few things, but I can still live my life the way I want to do. I just need to think of some other factors now. Um, but it was a huge knock on my confidence because I'd climb mountains, run marathons, um, and now... I don't have as much energy as I did before that because it hit my energy system, just ripped it to pieces. Um, so it's kind of, uh, it, was all, it was an awakening really. It was an awakening and it was just one of those things 
where you have to kind of look yourself in the mirror and say, look, you're not the machine anymore. You're getting older. Um, your body not as strong as it was when you were 22 when you're running marathons all the time. Um, but at the same time, I'm a great believer in look having these situations, these negative situations, and then always pulling the positive out of them. So saying, right, okay, what's the benefit of all of these things? Well, the benefit was I couldn't climb mountains for a year. But what I did do is I, I, I um, started walking around woodlands near where I lived. And then I started to understand the woodlands and understand trees and the relationship between trees and nature and everything like that. And now I have a business teaching people that. So what I think is that I had to go through that to now own the business, what I do, as well as the photography. But I teach people now about woodlands and trees and nature and everything. So I don't think I would be in that position now without going through that process in the Himalayas. So I now look at that situation and say thank you rather than look at it with a negative charge. So I think that's that's the journey that I had to come through. But I had to I had to like, you know, sit with people and speak to people and tell people things like that and then them say, Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And adventures and expeditions is all about that. It's it's vulnerability. It's being vulnerable and knowing saying to yourself, I'm not the machine, you know, I'm a human being. I have my ups, my downs, my insecurities, my strengths, my weaknesses. Um, and it's just honouring them, acknowledging them and just just trying to do the best that you can with with, with what you got. The, the, the culmination or the finishing of an expedition is, a, is, a, is an interesting one because this expedition that you've been doing and planning for for years is now a mile away, two miles away, one day away. Um, and leading up to that point, there's years of preparation and then there's day after day after day after day of check, checkpoints, mileage points, um, uh, resupplies and stuff like that that are getting you closer to your goal. And then when you get to the point of where your expedition is on the cusp, it's, it's, you're just excited. You just want to get to where you're going. But I can tell you that once you get to that point of when you finish, that feeling, that is momentary. You have the success and the happiness and the, the achievement and the joy of finishing something that you've been planning for years and the physical achievement and the mental achievement. But it is literally momentary. You then start thinking about, okay, how are we going to get home? We've got to get the flight in two days time. We've still got to get from here to there. And then when you come home, there is something more known like post-expedition depression of that, that transition between having a purpose, coming home, and then in some cases, not having anything to do. Um, and, and one of the most magnetic and hyp hypnotic things that I always found about expeditions is having something purposeful to do every day you wake up. It's having a routine, it's having a goal, it's having a purpose, it's having something awesome to achieve or try and achieve. And then when you go home, you don't have that. You're sitting there waking up in your bed and you might have your coffee and your comfort and, and the warmth and security, but you don't have that goal. And I think there's something intrinsic in every human being is our desire to achieve something every day. And then when we don't, the struggles start, the, the, the depression starts and our, our withdrawal starts and things like that. So the transition can be pretty hard, but there's one way to get around that. It's just to plan another expedition straight away. That's what I do. <laughs> or start writing about it and have that cathartic, you know, get it out of the system like visually or written, written because you could write a journal or write blog posts or magazines or whatever you want to do. But it's, it's a, sometimes can be quite a hard transition. And also coming back into society, one of the things that I did, the first things that I did when I came back off a big expedition was I went to a supermarket straight away and found myself a big supermarket, like a super, a big one. Um, and the queues of cars and the people and the bibbing and the people swearing and the stress and the pace and the anxiety of that. When you've been in a canoe for two months or three months or hiking for X amount of time, that is really overwhelming. And you can really feel and see why people go and live in these wild places to escape that. Because I think when you've, when you've been exposed to these wild places and the serenity and the peace, but also just having something purposeful to do every day, when you come home, you realize that how important expeditions or adventure is for the soul, I think. It's, 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 if you're carrying heavy weight or you're paddling or kayaking heavy weight or pulling heavy weight in some cases, um, okay, it's breaking stuff down into, into breaking the journey or whatever it is that you're doing down into, into steps, 100 meter 
checkpoints, 200 meter checkpoints, uh, a checkpoint to a lamppost or a tree. Um, and, and, and just thinking of the, the greater picture. And then if you just keep moving forward, no matter how slow, you're just one step closer. You're one, you're one mile closer to whatever it is that you want to be getting to, the goal that you want to be getting to. Um, and it's going to be painful. And I think you've got to accept the fact that adventure a lot of the time is uncomfortable, but that's what makes you grow, that the challenge is what makes you grow. And sometimes carrying heavy weight is, um, is just part of the process. You just gotta suck it up and enjoy it. If someone, if one of my team was feeling lonely, um, I would sort of, I would sit with them and speak to them one to one, find out what, what, what is the sort of the, the, the catalyst for that. And then straight away, give them a task like straight away give them something to do something meaningful to do that affects the group and affects the outcome of the expedition make them feel like they've got a they've got a purpose um maybe they feel that their position within the expedition or the adventure is not an impactful position so then what you do is you give them something that can be impactful and then you just monitor that and monitor their their feelings and their and 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 continue to give them something sort of impactful and meaningful to do um, and give them responsibility the way you make leaders out of people is but is but is by making them a leader give them leadership tasks um, and make make them feel important yeah respect people's boundaries um, respect the situation that you're in provide provide a framework for communication um, and communicate with that person especially if if, if there's issues that affect you both um, approach that person in a one-to-one -one situation. Do not embarrass them in front of the group. Do not highlight issues or problems in front of the group. Pull them to one side where you can both communicate, like you can be like man-to-man -man or man-to-woman, etc. Um, and just say, look, is there anything we can do to help you? Is there anything you can do to help me? Because ultimately, you're an important part of this expedition. I'm an important part of this expedition. Without it, we're both. You know, this this might not work. You might have really important roles. Um, and you've got to you've got to communicate and you've got to cross boundaries and you've got to man up a bit. You really do. And sometimes having those conversations are the hardest things you can do because there's emotions involved and there's energy involved. So it's 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 just coming to terms with the fact that you've got to have a difficult conversation and you've got to find a solution and a find find a way of working together. I would wait for the right time and then just approach them and pull them to one side and be, uh, and just ask them if they're okay. And I, I think the most important thing would be just to listen, just ask them a question and listen. Um, and, and, and not really try to be effectively a problem solver. Um, I think that, can't, that, that kind of comes a lot where we, on expeditions you try to solve a lot of problems and a lot of time sometimes you just need to listen. I would say prior to a journey and you're in a team, try and work out everybody's motivations for being on that trip. What, do they have personal goals? Uh, do they align with your goals as the expedition leader? Because you might have planned that expedition yourself. Um, are they are, are their goals in line with the greater vision of the journey and the story that you might be trying to tell or the story that you're following or river or mountain you're trying to climb? I have been on some expeditions where uh, I found out a later part of the expedition that people were more focused on social media notoriety than generally the goal of the expedition. And they need to remove themselves from the, from the expedition because there wasn't enough pictures being taken of them and they weren't being tagged in pictures and stuff like that. So I think that was my failing for the start of the trip for not understanding his goals for the trip. Um, but when we found out that we kind, we kind of incorporated his goals into my goals and we moved on from that. But those are the kind of things that, that can sort of hamper expeditions. You know, they can, they can pull expeditions apart, which ultimately then may lead to its failure. Yeah, I would say I would say get in what to f listen to things that are empowering, inspiring. Um, write about the environment, write about the expedition, but sort of fill yourself with good energy. Like think positive thoughts, you know, sort of feel good stuff. That's easy to say that when you're on an expedition and you're tired. That's something you can to draw on. That's quite hard, you know. Um, feeling lonely is a I I I believe poss possibly a choice that you that you're making and you can make you can take a choice and a decision to get to, to get out of that it might not be easy and you might need help but you know surround yourself with people and be open tell people that you're lonely that's a hard bridge to cross to say that to someone 
it's, it's really fingerprint specific down to the person, how they deal with that kind of stuff. You might be really, really connected to your family life at home or you might have been doing this for a longer time where you can kind of slightly, just gently separate yourself that from that. Um, I was on a trip once where I, I, uh, my mum had had a triple heart bypass while I was away. So, yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty difficult to deal with. With the fact of doing, with, or to come to terms with that. Um, my luckily, my dad didn't tell me the whole story because he didn't want to ruin the fact that I was on a trip. But I knew something. I knew something was up. Um, it's down to the person. You know, there might be you might be a position or a case where a person can, wants to go home if there's any difficulties or there's something major happening within the family that they can remove themselves from an expedition and get themselves home. A lot of the time, you're in such remote places that you know to get he a helo out or or to get yourselves out of there is is not a, a factor. So you might actually have to mentally deal with the fact that this is happening. And in that case, you know, you're gonna need a little support network around you, your teammates, you're gonna to need to talk, you're gonna to need to cry, you're gonna to need to open up, you're gonna need a shoulder. Um, but again, vulnerability is, is, is talking. When you internalize it, at some point it's gonna explode. When you get it out, it, it, people can help you. You've got, to, you've got to come to terms with that person that's come from a different part of the world, they have different culture, different beliefs, different religion, different religion to yours. Um, and not to take not to take that sort of at face value, not to let that corrode any values that conflict with mine. Um, and again, this is something that you, you would have hopefully spoken about before you brought that person onto trip. You know, expeditions are very personal experience. There's lots of close knit situations that happen. Um, and hopefully the people that you bring on those trips, or if you're part of that trip, uh, you've had that conversation um, and you've got those, you, you, you've, you've aired those differences as such so you know exactly where you are and just not to let any differences corrode the the, the main goal of the trip um again it, it, it comes down to the person that you, person that you are you know you shouldn't really be doing expeditions with other people from other cultures if the tiniest things like that just annoy the hell out of you you know you, I think you've got to be open-minded and flexible and um and yeah just be open-minded i think to other people's beliefs and cultures